Today on Great Lives, I'm joined by the business leader and broadcaster Sir Jerry Robinson, the man who was bold enough in his BBC Two series "Can Jerry Robinson Fix the NHS?" to attempt to reduce waiting lists at Rotherham General Hospital. Yet he's chosen a great life and a body of work as far from all this as it's possible to imagine, except. Geographically, Jerry, you were born in Ireland but moved to England in your teens, and you've chosen another Irishman who lived away for much of his life. Tell us who he is. It's、uh, Samuel Beckett, and、uh, I, I, there's something about Beckett's position in Ireland that 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 kind of sense of his timing, that his Protestant upbringing in, in in at a time when Ireland was changing, that I can, I can kind of relate to. So I could always relate, in a sense, to the man, although. To be honest, I I absolutely loathed his work when I first encountered it. I saw Godot waiting for Godot at the, at the Royal Court. I was about twenty four, twenty five at the time. I I came out of the theatre, kind of furious, feeling that I'd just wasted an evening and that this was pretentious nonsense. And I I really would have, I think I would have strangled him if I'd been able to get my hands on him at that point. And and why now?、Um, why it's a question Beckett himself would have loved. Why Samuel Beckett? Oh, there is just something about a feeling that this is somebody who wrote from inside himself in a totally honest way, with with feelings that we can all relate to, but that most of us don't want to touch. There's something about that feeling, that when you read Beckett and really read it, or better still, watch a well-performed Beckett play, you feel you're dealing with something very real, very from the heart. Jerry Robinson was born in a small village in Donegal, the ninth out of ten children of a carpenter. Although his family moved to England, he still thinks of himself, he says, as Irish. He says there's something useful about being outside a society because you can't be pigeonholed. Hackney Job Centre sent him to cost control at Matchbox Toys, beginning a business career which led him to become head of Coca-Cola UK at the age of 35. He's been chairman of Granada, B Sky B, ITN, Arts Council England, and Allied Domec. He's currently chairman of Moto Hospitality. Phew, that's quite a list. It's unusual for someone in your level in business to love Samuel Beckett, Jerry. Do they swap appreciations of his plays in the boardroom? Somehow, I can't quite see Sir Alan Sugar in the audience for <laughs>、no. one of his works. No, they really don't. And and what happened with me was that my daughter, who who's、uh, re- reading English, had to learn Lucky's speech, and she was. Furious about it because it was very very difficult for her to learn because she said you know I don't understand it so learning something you don't understand and it made me look again and you know read the speech and and I thought oh my god I really have missed the depth of this thing and I started to read about his life and it's an extraordinary life by by any standards this was a man who left Ireland you know went went to live in France actually you know fought in the resistance. Got the Croix de Guerre. Obviously, ended up getting the, the the Nobel Prize for Literature, and all the time somehow underplayed that part of it. And there's just something about Beckett that's just a little frightening. You almost feel you don't want to express an opinion about Beckett because he might not agree with it. And he's even though he's now dead, he was a very powerful, or, or feels to me like a very powerful influence. Well, well, to explore. The man and that life were joined by Jim Nolson, who was a personal friend of Samuel Beckett for 19 years and is his authorised biographer. He's also the emeritus professor of French at the University of Reading. Jim, a moment ago, Jerry spoke of learning the lines for a Beckett play, and saying how difficult it was to learn the lines of something that you didn't understand. If you, as a young actor or actress, Had said to Samuel Beckett, "I'm learning these lines, but I don't understand them. Explain them to me." What would his response have been? You don't need to understand too much. Just say it. You know, just say it. Concentrate on the rhythms, on the music. He was a very musical writer. But I got a lot of sympathy with what Jerry was saying earlier. I mean, I saw Waiting for Godot and Happy Days, and my principal reaction. To those plays when I first saw them in Glasgow at the time, was、uh, I don't understand what's going on at all here, but there's something that's got under my skin. What was Beckett like himself as a man? You know, I, I I've only seen a photograph of him. I imagine a rather dry, gloomy, edgy stick of a person. 
Do you really? I think that's a very funny reaction because I think he's a great humorist, extremely witty. Um, this, it was, though, Matthew, one of the myths, the great myth, that here is this man who writes gloomy prose, gloomy plays, and yet when you met him, if you asked any of his friends, they would say that it was great fun. He must have been an attractive man. He seems to have been pursued as well as yes. pursuing. Yes, very magnetic. Was he good looking? Yes, but in an unusual way. I mean, he had Nancy Cunard described his face as the face of an Aztec eagle. Yeah. You can't get over that uh, certainly impression. Certainly striking. You, you, you know, pictures of him yes. are absolutely striking. You, you know, you feel he ought to be on a postage stamp somewhere. Absolutely. It's so powerful. Sure. I, I never really thought of him as handsome from the pictures, but no. obviously he was he was attractive to women because he very he, magnetic. I've been in rooms when he has w been there, and women have walked in, and they're you know they've actually frozen, and 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 their hair almost stood on end. You know, <laughs> there, first of all there was the body of the athletic four hundred meter. Runner. Oh, really? Yes. I mean, he ran yeah. as well. I thought he was a bit of yes. a stick insect, obviously. No, not. no. He, he got very thin towards the end, so mm. that you could feel, when you embraced him, you could feel his shoulder blades through his sweater. Uh, but nonetheless, he was very handsome. I mean, I saw him really in the last 20 years, I guess, of his life. So I didn't see him until 1970, when he was 64. But still very handsome, still very striking in appearance. Did he laugh? Did he joke? Did he yes, drink? Did he entertain? He laughed. Yes. He, he I drank rather a lot, as, as I understand. <laughs> he drank rather what? a lot. But he was yeah. surely he was surely a troubled man, though, Jim. At, at a very level. troubled man. Yes. I mean, there are these beings, aren't there, who really you feel are existing at sensitivity maximum sensitivity level, and if you were in trouble as I was, for instance, once when my son had a terrible motorcycle accident and was in hospital in intensive care for days and days. Beckett called me every day, every day, uh, to see how Gregory was. But I'd like to make a point about humour. I mean, humour doesn't have to be escapist. It can actually batten down the hatches. It can... Oh, it very definitely, it very definitely can. Often. It's a way of coping, Matthew, with the way in which life throws these terrible things at you, strange, strange which we've all met. I'm not surprised that, that he called you, because somewhere through that gloom, you couldn't help feeling he was very darkly, you know, disturbed at some level. And he loved um, cricket, which, to my mind, combines gloom, uh, humour, <laughs> and, and, and a sense of the absurd. <laughs> or lovely. did he, am I right? He did. He loved cricket. He loved rugby football. He was a boxer at school. He played tennis, all kinds of sports, because the idea that here you have a gloomy intellectual was, in fact, only part of the uh, man. And, I mean, Beckett eludes definition. <laughs> this is the thing about Beckett. I want to find out a little bit about, about his, his origins, his, his background. Mm. Uh, it, it was, as I understand it, a, a reasonably prosperous middle-class suburban childhood. Yes, yeah. Beckett did come from a well-to-do family. You know, they lived in Fox Rock, which is a nice area of Dublin. His father was relatively well off. His mother was the daughter of a, a gentleman. So, yes, it was very well-to-do, but it was a very, in a sense, small Protestant community in Ireland. Ah, oh, the they, they, were, they were Protestants. Were they were very Protestants. much so. Yes. Yes. Very yes. much so. Very strongly Protestant. Church of Ireland at a time when Ireland itself was starting to face the beginnings of the free state. So it was a quite an awkward time to be, you know, from that background. And his mother was very much influenced by what people thought. So I think she was mm. quite a controlling, strongly controlling woman. And a lot of his writing, I think, came out of that, seemed to come out of that angst that that created for him. What was he like as a child, Jim? Do, do we know? Does he talk about it? Well, I, he talked about it to me a bit, yes. Mm. I mean, he loved solitude. He says in his German diaries in the 1936, I think it is, how I adore solitude. So he was different. And, of course, he escaped from this prudential morality of the family and fox rock well, to I the would, bohemianism uh, of Paris. I would argue that you never escape 
I uh, think from a prudential uh, no. morality. I, I don't agree. think you do. I, I, I'm a total believer that whatever goes in at yeah. that very early age, however you fight it, you know, is bubbling away and finds its way to the surface. And in fact, I'm sure that the best of his writing came out of exactly that angst. I wonder, yes. Jerry. I think uh, it did. I wonder yeah. whether there's some s- alienation is perhaps too strong a word, but um, Protestant family, reasonably well to do in Catholic Ireland, uh, rather suburban upbringing, this sort of distancing of himself from his surroundings and his, his, um, his life didn't most of it take place in Ireland, this, this partial alienation. Do you think that's important in, in the development of a, a, a man's genius, of his ideas, of his originality? I, th- I think there is something about, about being taken away or getting away from your yeah. roots or trying to get away from your roots that creates something of a kind of an artistic drive, if it's, if it's there. Well, you did. Uh, you... I did, but, but it wasn't for me, it wasn't a choice that I personally made. My family moved to England and I moved with them. Mm. I, 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 I don't think I ever had quite that kind of angst. And of yes. course, I've never written. <laughs> but you're hard to pigeonhole. You don't fit into any particular British establishment set. And I guess you must have felt that all through your career. Do you know, I've always felt it to be an enormous benefit. I, I'm a huge Anglophile. I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of kind of people in Ireland who aren't very pro-Britain. I, I've always loved the country. I've always felt it's a wonderful place to have lived, despite the fact I'm now living back in Ireland. And I think there's a welcoming because they can't quite pigeonhole you. I've never encountered the slightest difficulty no. about being Irish. No, but I'm interested that you, you, you talk about us British as they. Oh, uh, yeah, because I'm not, I'm not English. Yes, I'm, yes. I'm Irish. And, you know, the, the Tebbit test is maybe, <laughs> maybe more interesting than we think. But I've always felt that living in England was a great place to be and that there was an enormous fairness. You could do almost anything. And, and I'm certain that that coming in from outside is an advantage. Yes, you can it step is. back occasionally. I mean, uh, uh, Jerry yeah. talked about they. Who were we to Beckett, do you think? Or was everybody they? Was the whole well, world they? The English were and the French were definitely different. I mean, Beckett had a love-hate relationship. You're so right, both of you, when you say that he took a lot of the prudential morality and the Protestantism with him. There was an old-fashioned courtesy. He was indeed an Irish gentleman. There was Mm. something, just occasionally, things would bubble through with an expletive, where is that so-and-so waiter? (laughs) This would come through the surface. The drinking, which of course can be considered very Irish, was also a revolt against that kind of community where you didn't do that sort of shocking thing. Or if you did, you were talked about by your neighbours. So Paris was, you know, Paris of 1928, James Joyce... You know, that kind of freedom which you got in Bohemian Paris. But first, before Paris and before Not James before. Joyce, Dublin University, was, was Dublin he a good University. scholar? Well, very clever, extraordinary. I've read some of his notes and his essays when he was a student, and I've never had anybody in all my teaching career anything like as brilliant. This is BBC Radio 4. I'm Matthew Paris. And you're listening to Great Lives, where this week my guest, the business leader and broadcaster and analyst of the NHS, Jerry Robinson, has chosen the life of Samuel Beckett. Our expert witness is Professor Jim Nolson. After university in Dublin, he he goes off to Paris, Mm -hmm. um, as it turns out, really, to, to live in France for most of the rest of his life. That's not an obvious thing to do, is it, Jerry? You just no, except that there, there were quite there was a little clique of Irish uh, artists and writers in 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 Paris at that time, and and he was introduced to Joyce very early on yes. by I think it was uh, Tom McGreevy, Tom McGreevy, who yes. taught at the, the 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 school that Beckett went to teach at, and he must have spoken French from an early age very well. Oh, he did. He I mean he studied French yeah, obviously at university, and he found as as I often find, you know, when you speak to somebody who's you know, talking in a language other than their own, there's something very refining about that, that it limits what you can Absolutely. say. Yes. And, and, and I would imagine that for Beckett, who was uh, kind of famous for reducing rather than adding, that that language probably made his writing tighter. Very reductive sort reductive. of effect. Yes. So, when he changed from primarily writing in English to writing in French, it was really to try to get to the essence of things, expressing things 
not clearly because art didn't have a lot to do with clarity and doesn't really for Beckett, but trying to express things that with all the English associations, all the wordplay of James Joyce, he said in 1930, as early as that, he was 24 at the time, he said, I'll get away from J.J., James Joyce, before I die. So he was both under James Joyce's spell at that stage, but yes. also conscious almost of being oppressed yes. by the, the man's genius. Absolutely, yes. Yes, I mean, he said to me, I realised that Joyce had taken things as far as he could with piling up and adding things on. And what I wanted to do was to take things away, to pare things down, and it was easier to do that in French in another language, which is brilliant, because how many people do we know who actually can write in two Rare. different languages, create, and then create again the same book in the other language? Nabokov, and, and it was create again, wasn't it? Yeah. It wasn't translating. There the, the, was a strong feeling that when he translated his own work, yeah. there was a rewriting element to There are to a it. handful, well, Jerry. Right. Nabokov, Conrad, Ionesco, Beckett. Having gone to France, he is hit by t two major deaths in his life. Yes, uh, his father. His father. Hmm. His father mattered very much to Beckett. Yes. I mean, there was a very powerful... He, When I was talking to him for the biography, he would talk happily about his father. He didn't talk about his mother. Uh, that was very painful, and he didn't talk very much about his wife. You couldn't help feeling the father was a nice but slightly weak man in terms of his balancing May, his mother, who was obviously an extraordinarily dark, difficult woman. Dark, difficult, very powerful woman. And, and Intimidating, father, I would have thought. Yeah. The father was jovial, genial, was a hell fellow well met. And then after his father's death and the death of his cousin and, and lover, Peggy, Sinclair. He goes into psychoanalysis. He had to leave Ireland in order to be... psychoanalysis. He had yeah. a friend who was becoming a psychoanalyst, Geoffrey Thompson, mm. and he was down at the old Bedlam, you know, at Bethlehem uh, Hospital. And uh, he came over to have uh, analysis and had it with the, the so very famous analyst, Beyond. Beyond. Right. Wilfred Ruprecht, uh, Beyond. Yeah, yeah. Right. And that was, that mattered a lot, I think. And and he also underplayed it. He he. There were various quotes about him playing it down for you know, a few months, but actually it went on for a few years, didn't it? Well, would you yeah. say, Jerry? I, I wouldn't say mentally ill, but would you say that he was disturbed? Oh, I think he was disturbed. Mm. I, I I think he was disturbed. And and you know, with the type of mother that he had, it would be surprising if he weren't. But there was something about him trying to tackle it. I mean, when, when you talk about Beckett being disturbed, I mean, he had all kinds of uh, psychosomatic illnesses. Yeah. This, was, this was a man for whom what was happening inside was, was causing him real, real medical problems. He had boils, he had problems with his teeth, he had aching joints, he had constant kind of colds and flus. And this was a deeply disturbed man in my, in, in, in my view. And I'm sure that the analysis was enormously helpful. When and how, Jim, did he, he start publishing? Well, he started really when he was in Paris. I mean, he was writing very much in the manner of Joyce. He wrote an essay on Joyce, uh, which was published in 1929. And then he went on to write an extraordinarily extravagant and very Joycean in parts novel, which wasn't published until after his death, called Dream of Fair to Middling it's Women. A great title, isn't it? <laughs> what a, what a title, you know? And I have a note here, More Pricks Than Kicks. More what, what was that? More Pricks Than Kicks was a collection of short stories about a figure called Bellacqua from Dante. But, I mean, these are an acquired taste, but the, they are the great wonderful. Thing about, sorry, James, but the great yeah. thing about that title was that it actually came from a biblical quote. Absolutely. And, and you can just imagine oh, of course, the joy. kicking against the prince. Yes, against yes. The you prince. can yes. just yes. imagine the joy that yes. Beckett got out of that. Very much so, yes. And then, of course, it finished up banned because of, partly because of the title, because I'm sure they hadn't read it. But uh, there was a scatological element to Beckett's work. Pre-war, there's a, a Pre tour of uh, Nazi Germany. He, he came away very disturbed by that. Very he? disturbed. He, he, he was in yes. there in the early stages and mm. recognised that something was happening which was, which was not good. But somehow he, he, he separated himself from all things political, really, didn't he? He wasn't interested in politics per se. Maybe I should say that I thought that that had been perhaps one of the myths. Oh, OK. And when you actually started to talk to Beckett, 
He was a left winger. He took the left wing newspapers. He uh, refused to allow his plays to be performed when there was not a fully integrated audience in South Africa. So there were these things. But let's separate what he did as a writer from what he was as a man. Perhaps he had a professional sense of distance. Absolutely. He was particularly interested in and sympathised with, empathised with the down and out, the down trauma. Yes, but I mean, the two tramps, there's a bit of sadism there, isn't there? There is a sadism. Mm. I mean, this was written, remember, Matthew, after the Second World War. Mm. And he, remember, uh, you're talking about him not being political, Mm. he said to me, when his friends were being arrested, Paul Leon, Joyce as amanuensis, was arrested and carted off to concentration camps. Beckett was sending him his cigarettes through an intermediary, and he joined the resistance. You I couldn't was, stand uh, by with your arms folded, and let it go. he said to me. He said it was just Boy Scout stuff, didn't he? He was, he was yeah. famously quoted as saying, saying that, so he didn't make much of it. What did he do in the resistance? How serious was his part? Well, he was at the cutting edge. I mean, when he was handling the reports coming in from agents and praising them, because that was what he was doing, then taking them around to the flat of a photographer who put them onto microfilm, when he had them in his flat, that was the dangerous time. I mean, if you were raided then, you'd had it. So he would have gone as his best friend Mm. Alfred Perron went to Mauthausen, and Beckett would have gone with him. Because they, they, they were raided, and um, lo- lots within of his, a couple of hours. His comrades he were, were executed. He was on yeah. the run for weeks, putting on a false moustache at one point and looking terribly like a, an English pilot or something, somebody <laughs> told him. But I think the important thing here is that he really did something which was very significant, and then he never told anybody. Right. So that, even that's, his that's very closest Beckett, friends after the war didn't know that he'd got the prize. Croix de Guerre. Croix de Guerre yeah. and the Resistance uh, Award medal. The medal of so in this case, about, Jerry, uh, it, it, it's more a matter of there being more to his heroine. As yeah, the, but how wonderful is that? I mean, yes, that, that yes. to me is, I, I want to hear that. Yes. Because you have that sense of Beckett always kind of underplaying. But where do you think that comes from, that, that kind of extraordinary underplaying? He was always very critical of his own work. He, th- there was that yes. putting himself down yes. all the time. It, it maybe comes from the background that you were talking mm. about. You know, mm. you didn't boast about things and yet here was somebody who knew his worth but you didn't talk about things what you'd done during the war but in fact that was another you talked about the psychoanalysis that was another crucial thing in his work with the impact of the uh, war years I get the sense Jerry that at this stage in his life or perhaps earlier he's decided that he doesn't trust language oh I can see that because it's an increasing simplification of what's been said. It's a distillation process. And trying writing it all in French and then translating it. He realised that language lets us down all the time. We try to communicate, we don't manage it, and we never manage, or very rarely do we manage to get to the essentials of being. The moment we communicate, we mislead, in we a mislead. sense. Yeah, and that, that's particularly true in the emotional yeah. field, isn't it? Mm. It is. It's, it's particularly true that the, the, yes. the deeper inside yourself you're trying to explain, the more, the more limiting language becomes. Yes. I mean, here you have a wonderful ambiguity. You have a word man... Joyce was known as the word man. You have a word man who was as enamoured of words as James Joyce, but who distrusts words at the same time. We, we forget that um, <clears throat> Waiting for Godot is actually en attendant Godot. It was first written in French and Absolutely. then translated by himself in, into English. I saw it for the first time just um, a year or so ago, the, the uh, production with Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart. I had expected to hate it. I I hated everything I thought I knew about Beckett, which wasn't very much. Uh, And instead, I just thought it was an absolutely amazing play. Amazing. It is, The humour. Yeah, the humour, yes. 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 I mean, that did come out terribly well, particularly in Ian McKellen. Now, that's appropriate, isn't it? Some people have said they shouldn't have played it for laughs, but I felt the laughs were... I do agree with you that laughs were essential. Yes. I mean, Godot is a very funny play. Was Godot an immediate success? Uh, yes, it was actually in French. It became the intellectual's real 
prize that you went to see, and you often people didn't understand, as you were saying, but no. they prised themselves at having gone. To the French see. love things; they don't. They love, yeah. Them. As I understand, it struggled a bit in English, didn't it? Until was it Kenneth Tynan who who, who yes. wrote a very positive? Yes, Tynan uh, and our Harold Hobson. Hobson. And, Hobson and, particularly. And it then became this thing which took on a life of its own. I mean, the interpretations mm. of Godot are mind-blowing, aren't they? They are. You, and, and I think that part of its success was its capacity to be interpreted in all kinds of ways. After this success, he, he becomes uh, relatively prosperous. He, he builds himself a small house outside Paris. His, materially, his life enters a, a fairly comfortable mm. phase. And he, gave it, he gave most of it away. Did he? Yes, yeah. gave a huge amount, including the Nobel Prize. After, I think, three days, he'd given the whole Nobel Prize away to different places like Trinity College Library and friends who that were That was 1969, wasn't that was it? 69. The most beautiful citation yeah. for his writing, which, in new forms for the novel and drama, in the destitution of modern man, acquires its elevation. It's wonderful, isn't, isn't it? it? Yes. It is wonderful. I've read, Jerry, that uh, one of your favourite sayings is from uh, Milan Kundera's The Unbearable Lightness of Being. I've never taken life that seriously because I have the sense of it not mattering that much. It mattered a lot to Beckett, didn't it? Well, I'm I'm not sure it did. I, he he had this kind of wonderful dilemma, really, that that we we kind of recognised that life had no value, but we still wanted to hold on to it. There was a d- dichotomy for for Beckett that I think, and and I think that's true. If you you know when you do think about what what life is about, you, you do have to give it its own value for you and live to that and. Beckett, in a way, almost represents that better than anyone else I've, I've ever read. What do you think right. he thought mattered, yeah. Jim? I think that people, individuals, friends mattered. If you were down in any kind of trouble, then Beckett was the one. What do you think, Jerry, is his lasting influence, will be his lasting influence on literature? Beckett would be the prime example for me of somebody writing from the darker side of themselves in, in in a way which we can genuinely relate to, almost separating himself from from the writing in a way that is pure. And and the writing was, was absolutely vital to him. And, and th- there's a quote that, for me, absolutely drives home Beckett's position. He said, I couldn't have done it otherwise when asked about life. He said, gone on, I mean, I could not have gone through the awful mess of life without having left a stain upon the silence. 